Brother Philip, you come ahead, please. I ask Brother Philip to speak today. I'm excited to hear what the Lord has laid on his heart. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Turn to Judges chapter 13. I'm going to read a couple verses there at the end of the chapter, and then we'll back up and go through the story. In verse 24, And the woman bare a son, and called his name Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtol. Does that fit your image of Samson? The Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord moved him. I will have to say, I had to kind of stutter over those verses. That really didn't match what I thought of Samson. And I, other people have over the years, I've heard it said, you know, it's a wonder that Samson is in Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. Samson seemed like kind of a wretched character. I've also heard that, you know, Samson was a Nazarite, and there were three requirements of the Nazarite. They weren't to drink wine, they weren't to touch dead bodies, and they weren't to cut their hair, and Samson broke all three of those. I've also heard that it's a wonder that God answered Samson's final prayer, a prayer for revenge and suicide. Well, I can't say I blame people for feeling that way or thinking that because I kind of had sort of the same idea. It's like, what? Samson doesn't seem like that great of a character. So several weeks ago, I started a character study on Samson. Now, but his character doesn't look as bad as what you know, I had thought or supposed. But there's also a lot of good lessons in the story of Samson. So we're going to go through the story of Samson. We're going to be taking lessons from Samson. So back up in the beginning in chapter 13, verse 1. And the children did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. And so let's look a little bit at the context of the story of Samson, the, the beginning here where it starts. The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Israel was not at its prime here. Godliness was not prospering and flourishing and doing well. Well, Israel was in a stage of apostasy here. Also, and I'll keep in mind with the, the judges here, this is a region of Israel. Many of the judges were regional judges, not over the whole nation. And it's possible that some of these judges overlap a little bit. I'm not sure exactly the time frame of Samson. However, if we look we, at the, um, the surrounding chapters, after Samson we have the story of Micah, where he, he had stole some silver from his mother, and when he returned it to his mother, she said, I dedicated it to the Lord to make a graven image. It's like, okay, what? In Israel? And we have the story of the Danites and how they came along, and they were glad to have this priest and this idol and all that for themselves. We go on and we find the story of the Levite and his concubine, and then how the Benjamites defended these vile men of Gibeah, there is a lot of really bad things going on. I don't know where this is in relation to the story of Eli. I suppose it to be before that. In the time of Eli, his sons who were priests were vile. What was the state of the priesthood? What was 
Samson's connection to the priesthood at this time? Were they still regularly going to, would have been a Shiloh at that time? Could Samson read? Where was the nearest copy of the law? So we can sit here easily and criticize Samson because we've got the word of God and we say, well, he should have done this or he should have done that. Actually, for his circumstances, he may have done quite well. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not. But thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, eat not any unclean thing. For though thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, but the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So this child is to be a Nazarite, and let's go over to Numbers chapter 6, and we'll look at the law of the Nazarite. What were the requirements for a Nazarite? So in Numbers chapter 6, we'll start in verse 1. And the Lord said un spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, when either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite to separate themselves unto the Lord. Now, take notice it says man or woman. For on in these verses, it's referred to in the masculine, but it is referring to either a man or a woman. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. And shall drink no vinegar of the wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. Now I'm not familiar of anywhere else in the Bible that grapes were forbidden. Okay, wine was forbidden. The priests were forbidden to drink wine when they went in. Well, let's see, in, in Leviticus 10.8, the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor drink strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. And I would assume probably that this was to guard against drunkenness. In other words, you could drink a little wine and be okay. You could drink more wine and be drunk. Where's the limit? Just avoid it. When you're doing the office of the priest, abstain from that. But I'm not aware anywhere else that grapes were forbidden. I really don't know why that was forbidden, what the reason was. But as long as they had the vow, they were not to eat grapes. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord, and he shall be holy and shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow. All the days he, that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. And then it goes on to explain, he shall not make himself unclean for father or for mother, for his brother, or for his sister, when they die, because the consecration of his God is upon him. Now this does not mean that he could not touch the dead body of an animal. This is specifically talking about the dead body of another person. All the days of his separation he is holy unto the Lord. If any man die very suddenly by him, and he hath defiled the head of his consecration, then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing, on the seventh day shall he shave it, and on the eighth day he shall bring two turtles, that would be two turtle doves, or two young pigeons to the priest, to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall offer one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering. 
and make an atonement for him, for that he sinned by the dead, and shall hallow his head that same day. Now it's interesting, it says hallow his head, and we'll talk more about that just a little bit. And he shall consecrate unto the Lord the days of his separation, and shall bring a lamb of the first year for a trespass offering. But the days that were before shall be lost because of his separate because his separation was defiled. And take note he had to shave his hair there. And this is the law of the Nazarite, when the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and he shall offer his offering unto the Lord, one lamb of the first year without blemish, for a burnt offering, one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish, for a sin offering, and one ram without blemish, for a peace offering, and a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, and wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil, and their meat offering and their drink offerings. And the priest shall bring them before the Lord, and shall offer his sin offering and his burnt offering. He shall offer the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord, with the basket of unleavened bread. And the priest shall offer also his meat offering and his drink offering. And the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation, at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall take the hair of the head of his separation. Now this is important. And shall put it in the fire which is under the sacrifice of the peace offering. And the priest shall take the sodden shoulder of the ram and one unleavened cake out of the basket and one unleavened wafer, and shall put them upon the hands of the Nazarite after the hair of his separation is shaven. And the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. This is holy for the priest with the wave breast and the heave shoulder. And after that, the Nazarite may drink wine. In other words, his vow is completed. This is the law of the Nazarite who hath vowed and of his offering unto the Lord for his separation. Beside that his hand shall get according to the vow which he vowed. So he must do after the law of his separation. And so... When someone made a vow, this was either man or woman, but they made a vow of a Nazarite, they would be shaved. After the time was completed, they would come to the priest, to the tabernacle, and they would again be shaved. And there was a sacrifice that was offered. Their hair was offered with the sacrifice. Now, keep this in mind. Okay, Paul says in Acts chapter 18... Um, let's see, he, he tarried there yet a good while, then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sancria, for he had a vow. So he began his vow, and when he began his vow, he shaved his head, and then at the end of the vow, he's in Jerusalem at the temple, and he would again be shaved, and that hair was offered on the altar. That hair was a token of the time span. So if you were a Nazarite, you had a vow for six months, you would have six months' growth of hair to offer on the altar. If you were a Nazarite for a year, you would have a year's growth of hair to offer on the altar as a sacrifice, as a token of the time that had been given to the Lord. And that's important, and we'll get back to that later. I don't know if we'll get there today actually but keep that in mind that's that was the hair of the Nazarite and why why that was okay so back to Judges chapter 13 then the woman came and told her husband saying a man of God came unto me and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God very terrible but I asked him not whence he was neither told me he me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. So this son is not even conceived yet. Now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child should be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. The child has not yet been conceived, and already his life is laid out for him. 
before he was born. God says to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down, to build and to plant. Before he was born. Was, were his preferences consulted? Did God ask him if he wanted to do this? Did God say, would it be okay if I send you the nations? You're going you're gonna to preach condemnation to kings. You're going to tell the kingdoms that destruction's coming. You're going to tear down, root up. Did God say, do you, do you feel up to the task? Do you think you can do it? Did God say, would it, would it be okay if we put this in your life? What if, what if Jeremiah... No, no thanks, God. I, I really would prefer to lead a quiet life. He didn't have that option. Okay, he wasn't asked. He was told, before you were born, before you were even conceived, this is what I decided you're going to do. Now go do it. Wow. What about before man was formed? God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle. Over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, male and female created he them. And God had a plan. God had a purpose. Now how would you like if when you were born, you found out that before you were born, your parents discussed what you were going to be. And they decided, you know, I think you're going to be a preacher. You know, you're going to be a Nazarite. All your life, don't drink any wine, don't cut your hair, don't come at any dead bodies, you know. To us, that would seem like, who wants to come at a dead body anyway? But basically, you were not allowed to bury your parents. Somebody else had to do that. How, how would you like that if your parents planned out your life, didn't consult your preferences, just told you this is, this is what we've laid out for you, now go do it. Would you do as good of a job as God's men did? Do you realize that before man was created, God had their life laid out. He had a plan for them. He had a commission for them. Man was to be in God's image. Did God ask Adam, hey, how would you like to have dominion over the animals and be in my image and take care of the garden? Um, just not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. No, he wasn't asked. His preferences weren't consulted. He was just given a commission and told to do it. Yeah. And you go to hell if you don't. Oh. Would that kind of insult you? So how do you do <clears throat> with the rules that have been laid out for you? Good. Your parents make rules. They set guidelines. Is that okay? They didn't ask you for preferences. Actually, probably most parents do consider their children's preferences. Certainly every good parent, and God for sure, considers what is in the best interest of their children. 
But it's not necessary that your parents find out from you first what you would like to do. It's not necessary that God finds out from you first what you would like to do. He can just give you a commission and say, do it. Mm -hmm. And then you are rated on how well you perform the task that you didn't come up with. How well you, you followed the assignment you were given. Even the, it, You know, Moses tried that when God said, go to Egypt. And Moses was like, no thank you, God. I'm not up to that. And God got angry. Who made your mouth? Okay, who made you? You wouldn't have even been born if I didn't have a plan for you. So now just go do it. Stop whining about how you don't like it. I'm not enjoying this. It's not making me happy. It's not what I had planned. You know, I think sometimes life gets out of control. I don't know how to handle this. You were given a task. Take care of it. My preferences weren't consulted. That's an insult, isn't it? No, deal with it. You're given a job, just do it. Think you can live with that kind of a God? Well, you better would. Let's go on down to verse 24. Chapter 13 there. That's where we read at the beginning. The woman bare a son and called his name Samson. The child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtel. Notice this is in an a area, the region around Dan. Samson is a Danite. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. You suppose Samson had ever heard the story of why he was born? Maybe he wasn't paying attention. Or maybe, maybe he just hadn't got the vision yet. He was supposed to be an enemy to the Philistines because they were an enemy to God. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. <clears throat> now what does it mean there? It was of the Lord. How can this be of the Lord that Samson take a foreign wife when that was forbidden? In 1 Kings chapter 22, Ahab is wanting to go up to Ramoth Gilead to war. He wants Jehoshaphat to go with him, and they've got all the prophets prophesying of success. Jehoshaphat was concerned because there's not a prophet of the Lord here. Can we get a prophet of the Lord and see what he will say? So they sent for Micaiah. So he came to the king, and the king said unto Micaiah, Shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? Now that's a pitiful situation when the prophet tells you something good and you know it's not true because you know God's got nothing good to say to you. And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jeho Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, 
and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. There came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said unto him, Wherewith? He said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets. And the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. So how is this that the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of Ahab's prophets? The Lord did not stop it or prevent it. Ahab was wicked. And the time had come, God said, it's time we get rid of Ahab. So God withheld protection from Ahab, knowing that that would allow a lying spirit to come into his prophets. Ahab would be deceived and go to Ramoth Gilead to his own destruction. If God withdraws his protection from you, he will send you strong delusions. He will allow you to lose your mind. To do that which is irrational and unreasonable. Why? Why would God allow such a thing? That can't be good. That can't be right. Because you put yourself on the side against God. God is forwarding His cause. And you got in the way. Now here was Samson... Samson, it appears, is, is not paying attention. He's not, maybe it's just that he's young yet and doesn't know how to go about it. So God says, okay, he's attracted to that woman. Let that go. And he's soon going to figure out why the Philistines aren't his friends. If we just let him eat the fruit of that path, He'll wake up and understand. If you pay attention to God and what He wants you to do, okay, remember He had a plan for man. He left instructions. He left a manual. If you're paying attention, you can avoid a lot of very nasty circumstances. Because God doesn't have to put you through them to get you to wake up. An interesting note, something I want to mention here. If you grow up in an ungodly home, you grow up in a bad environment, when you come to God and you want to do what's right, you come with a lot of baggage. We'll use an example, music. You listen to a lot of ungodly music. When you repent and turn to God and want to do what's right, your mind just doesn't get scrubbed clean and you forget everything you ever heard. There's baggage. However, along with that baggage, you've seen the end of the road. You've seen where this leads. You've seen the problems this causes. If you grow up in a good home, a godly home, you're taught right principles, you're sheltered from those things, you don't, you don't see the harm. But you don't have the baggage either. You don't have to go dabbling around to see where the end of the road is. Just follow the instructions. You'll save yourself a lot of trouble, a lot of heartache and misery. But those who have been there Seeing the end of the road, seeing the heartache, the wreckage, helps them to come back and overcome the, overcome the baggage, overcome the bad start. Solomon. It seemed like he went dabbling around. He wanted to investigate, to see what was good for the sons of men. It's like, just follow the instructions. You don't have to know where that goes. If God said no, trust 
him. He had your best interest in mind. <clears throat> then went Samson down and his father and mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath. So it's, and behold, a young lion roared against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid, and had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. And he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. And after a time, he returned to take her and turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother and gave them, and they did eat. But he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. <clears throat> now, I'm not sure if his father and mother were familiar with him slaying the lion, but not that he took the honey. It, it appears that it says he didn't tell his father or his mother. So they went down with him, but apparently were not with him at the time that the lion came. And he killed the lion. So here it is supposed that he's violated the vow of the Nazarite now by touching the carcass of an unclean animal. In Leviticus, it gives instructions concerning the carcass of an unclean animal. In Leviticus 11, 27, whatsoever goeth upon his paws, that would be a lion or other similar beasts, among all manner of beasts that go on all four, these are unclean unto you. Whosoever touches their carcass shall be unclean until the even. Okay, so just until the evening. He that beareth the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the even. They are unclean unto you. So the worst um, defilement this would have been, taking the honey from the carcass, if you would count that similar to bearing the carcass, is that Samson would have had to wash his clothes and be unclean till the evening. It does not appear that he hid this from his parents because it was a grievous violation of his Nazarite vow. I think the reason we are given the story and the reason we are told that he didn't tell his father or his mother is setting the stage for the next story. So his father went down unto the woman, and Samson made there a feast, for so used the young men to do. And it came to pass, when they saw him, that they brought thirty companions to be with him. And Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you, if ye can certainly declare it me within the seven days of the feast, and find it out, then will I give you thirty sheets and thirty changes of garments. Now, a note on this, this feast here. So the feast lasted for seven days, and the seven days is referring to the feast here. We'll, we'll read some more of that in a little bit. But I've heard here, so they had a feast. They had a wedding feast. This is where Samson drank wine because they had wine at their weddings. That's pretty shallow. Did you know Amish don't drive cars? But I've seen Amish in stores, and you drive cars to go to stores, so I know Amish drive. That's pretty shallow. You would assume that if Samson had a vow and he was not to drink wine, if he was at a feast where there was wine, he didn't drink. Just because he was at a feast where there was wine doesn't mean, well, he obviously drank wine because that's what they did at their weddings. So he put forth the riddle. It says, if you can declare it me within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 sheets and 30 changes of garments. But if you cannot declare it me, then shall you give me 30 sheets and 30 changes of garments. And they said unto him, put forth thy riddle that we may hear it. Now in saying that, they're agreeing to it, to the conditions. And he said unto them, out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And they could not in three days expound the riddle. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband, that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee in thy father's house with fire. 
Have ye called us to take that we have? Is it not so? And Samson's wife wept before him, and said, Thou dost but hate me, and lovest me not. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people, and hast not told it me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father, nor my mother, and shall I tell it thee? Now it does not appear that he was trying to hide the answer to the riddle from his parents. It was just he didn't see the need to tell them. However, at this point now, he wants to hide the answer because he's got a lot at stake. He's got a riddle with a pretty high price on the answer. And she wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted. And it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her, because she lay sore upon him, and she told the riddle to the children of her people. Now, on the seven days, so he said, if you can declare it me within the seven days, then he puts forth his riddle, and it says, they could not in three days expound the riddle. The seventh day they said unto Samson's wife, and tithes the husband, that he may declare unto us the riddle. So what happened to the other days? It's a seven day feast. They couldn't expound the riddle in three days. And on the seventh day they come to Samson's wife. And then it says, she wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted. Okay. It appears that he put forth the riddle at about the middle of the feast. The seven days is, refer is referring to the feast. When it says she wept before him the seven days, it doesn't mean she wept before him for seven days. But she wept before him during the time of their feast. So it appears that he put the riddle forth in about the middle of the feast. In three days, which brought them to the seventh day, they could not expound the riddle. It does not appear that they had seven days to expound it, but that they had at the most four. So they come to her, and she wept before him for one day, is what it appears to be there. And before sundown, he told her. And the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day, before the sun went down, Wow, that got around fast. What is sweeter than honey, and what is stronger than a lion? And he said unto them, If ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle. A note here. If you don't want anybody to tell your secret, don't tell anybody. Do you trust somebody else to keep a secret better than you do? Now she's weeping and crying and saying, you don't love me, you know why? It's what you call crocodile tears. But what do you expect then? You expect if somebody weeps and cries before her and tells her that she doesn't love them, she'll keep your secret? You know, Samson doesn't realize they've already threatened to kill her if she doesn't give the secret. So he tells his secret, and she promptly does likewise. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon, and slew thirty men of them, and took their spoil, and gave change of garments unto them, which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. But Samson's wife was given to his companion, whom he had used as his friend. So they came to her, and they said, Hast thou called us here to take, us, take what we have? Is it not so? You invited us to your wedding just to take what we have. What kind of robbers are you? And yet they had no scruples against taking Samson's wife as soon as she leaves town. She was given to one of his companions that was used as his friend. No doubt one of the 30. So... It was no sense of justice on their side. They didn't feel that somehow Samson's riddle was unfair. 
They just didn't like it because it was inconvenient to them. And so they used unjust means, unfair means, to find out the riddle. It's not justice, it's just them looking after themselves. They, they weren't opposed to robbery, as long as it was them robbing Samson, not the other way around. Samson's wife betrayed him. Samson looked and he saw a pretty girl over there among the Philistines. He could see she was pretty. That was obvious. She could talk good. That was obvious. He assumed she had the character of his mother. He assumed she was submissive. She was a good housekeeper. A godly woman. Why not? You see some pretty girl out in town, wouldn't you assume that she would have the same virtues as your mother and your sisters? No. No. You grow up in a household where there's, there's standards, there's laws, there's, you know, rules you have to live by. And you see someone that's allowed to do things that you're not allowed to do. And you assume that's the only difference. I mean, in all other aspects, they're still um, neat, clean, orderly people. They're honest. I mean, they're dependable, right? No. Why would you assume that? Because you've never seen otherwise. Like I said earlier, you grew up in a good home. You didn't see the end of the road. So you just assumed that the end of that road was just like the road you were on, only a little bit better. Why not? You just been fooled. Okay? You just weren't paying attention. You weren't listening to the instructions. The end of that road was bad. That's why you were told not to go on that road. That's why in the home you grew up in, there was discipline, there was order, there was a schedule, there was rules. Because they were trying to save you from the end of that road. You know, it, it just looks like easy money without work. Right? Wouldn't that be good? Oh, there's strings attached. There's a downside. There's a snag there. Well, I, I didn't see that. We just follow instructions. Okay? You're not smart enough to figure everything out on your own. You're not strong enough to handle every temptation. Okay, continuing on, we're in chapter 15. But it came to pass within a while after, in the time of wheat harvest, that Samson visited his wife with a kid, why would he do that? It came to pass after a while. Now Samson's interested in his wife. No. With time, feelings change. <coughs> Count on it. If you see something, you recognize something, you know, that's bad, I need to deal with it. Deal with it now. If you see dangers, you see temptation, that's, that I see risk there. Set a guardrail. Put a standard. Given enough of time, feelings change, and your feelings may well change. And what you see, what you recognize, you say, that's dangerous, I want nothing to do with that. Give it time. Give it time, and just wait. So, when you see that, deal with it now. Take measures to see to it that you don't cross the line where you saw the danger. And he said, I will go into my wife, into the chamber, but her father would not suffer him to go in. And her father said, I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her, therefore I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. So her father's trying to offer some sort of recompense here. 
Samson said concerning them, Now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. And Samson went and caught three hundred foxes and took firebrands and turned tail to tail and put a firebrand in the midst between two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines and burned up both the shocks and also the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. Then the Philistines said, Who hath done this? And they answered Samson, the, son of, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he had given his wife, he had taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. Why? Why did they burn her and her father with fire? Well, because it was just, because they had wronged Samson. Right? More likely, it was to try and appease Samson. They really didn't do justice to the situation. Samson didn't think so, and I think probably that's correct. This Tim Knight and his daughter had inconvenienced them, had caused a problem, had caused crop damage, and it was the easiest thing to deal with. So take care of them. Hope Samson will leave us alone. So Samson's wife was threatened. She was told, if you don't find out the riddle and tell us, we're going to burn you in your father's house with fire. So she betrayed Samson, wept before him and got him to tell her the secret, and then went and told the secret to her people. Take note, her loyalty was with her people. Expect someone's loyalty to be with their kin unless they've proven otherwise. Expect someone's loyalty to be with their people unless they've proven otherwise. But she betrayed Samson, told his riddle, and the end result is her and her father get burned with fire. Didn't turn out the way she was expecting. What should have she done in the situation? What would have been the best course for her to take? Looking back, we can see. It would have been best for her to stick with Samson. But these 30 men are going to come up and burn you and your father's house with fire. Okay? Samson's just proved he can kill 30 Philistines. In a little bit, he's going to prove he can kill more. The wisest, safest path for her would have been to do what's right. Not coincidental. Take note of something in this. You can despise Samson. He's, he's going and, and taking a foreign wife. In this story, in this scenario, Samson was God's man. The Spirit of God was with Samson, and it was not wise to oppose him. Remember, Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses because he'd taken an Ethiopian woman. And God said, Who is there as my servant Moses with whom I'll speak face to face? Therefore, why weren't you afraid to criticize him? Okay, this is my man. But we found a flaw. We found a fault. Samson somewhat took it upon himself because he stepped out of line when he went to take a Philistine wife. But he was still God's man. The smartest thing to do was still to stay on his side. Don't get at odds with Samson because the Spirit of God is behind him and he can do some massive destruction. We'll see more of that later. When you see God's men, when you see the Spirit of God there, when you see what's right, 
but you see a flaw. Therefore, that justifies me in tearing the whole thing apart. Oh, I've seen that way too many times. Because Moses had a flaw, we don't need to obey him. He's trying to take us from Egypt to the promised land. We're going to wreck the whole thing. No, Moses is God's man. But he had a flaw. God can deal with that. Proverbs 24, 15 says, Lay not wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Spoil not his resting place. For a just man falleth seven times and rises up again. But the wicked fall into mischief. God can deal with his people, his man. He can correct them. They might make mistakes. You know, it seems... Absalom and Ahithophel, David messed up. David deserved to die. God says, I'll deal with David, but David's my man. You go to war against him, it's going to be your bloodshed. Okay, let's move on. Verse 7. And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. And he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. And he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock Etam. Then the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why are ye come up against us? And they answered, To bind Samson or we come up, to do to him as he has done to us. Samson thinks it's just now, but now they think it's not just. It's typical. If you ever listen to children, the way they quarrel, it sounds like that here. Then the 3,000 men of Judah went up to the top of the rocky Tam and said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, As they did unto me, so have I done unto them. Now what is happening here? Samson has set himself against the Philistines. He's now opposed to the Philistines. Samson is becoming Israel's strong man. We can read the account, okay, in the time of Samuel, when Israel gathered together, they were repenting and getting right with God. The Philistines saw Israel gathered together. And so they gathered together. They want to come up and squash this. It seems the situation was Israel was weak and the Philistines could spoil them. It wasn't that there was continually a Philistine army invading. But rather that there was the understanding, you are under us. Okay, if you're an Israelite, you make way for a Philistine. If you become a problem and fight a Philistine, you may kill him, okay, you won. Now we're going to come up and get you. We see the same thing when David was made king. When the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king, they come up to get him. Okay, take out Israel's strong man. Keep Israel weak because we want to dominate Israel. Samson is here becoming Israel's strong man. The Philistines see there's an Israelite here that we can't control. He's strong. He's going to protect and defend the nation and interfere with our ability to spoil them. So they gather an army together to come up and squash Samson. This is, it's not just an issue of Samson. This has become a national struggle. It looks like we're pretty well out of time, so I think we're going to wrap it up there. There's, there's a lot more, but the story of Samson goes on. Father, we're going to have to do some more of that another time.
But we see here that Samson, God's plan, God has successfully got Samson at war with the Philistines now. And Samson has God's spirit behind him. And he's become invincible. This is one man. Samson didn't have an army. But he is beginning to deliver Israel. Yeah, this is one of those stories where we learn God's appropriateness and uh, learn to look at things from God's perspective. Israel was greatly impoverished and trodden down because of the Philistines. And God basically said, I'm going to take an incredibly strong man and drop him in this mix right here. And it's going to cause all kinds of problems for the Philistines. And God allowed it and allowed Samson to prosper and deliver Israel. He judged Israel for 20 years. We don't hear about every day of the 20 years, okay? But Samson began to uh, feel overconfident. And every time someone begins to feel like their power and their strength and their connection to God is unbreakable, they usually mess up. But... Um, Anyway, let's stand together. Thank you, Brother Philip. I'm sure there's a lot more that could be said there, and uh, it, it's just quite a story that God dropped in the midst there. Um, the Philistines had no right to be dominating God's nation. This was a national issue. The nation was crying out to God. God's answer to that was to drop Samson in the mix and cause all kinds of uh, havoc. And uh, God knows the boundaries of appropriateness before he did it and while he did it. And we are, to, we are not to set ourselves as judges of God's appropriateness. We are to learn from that appropriateness. Samson did not violate his Nazarite vow by slaying a man any more than Samuel did by hewing Agag in pieces. Mm -hmm. Okay? So there's things to learn. And woe unto the people who just assume and pass judgment on God as though God is inconsistent or God shouldn't have done that. Um, some of these stories are set in there probably just to test that in you to see if you're going to learn or judge. If you're going to set yourself up as an authority, or if you're going to sit at the Lord's feet and say, teach me, I need to learn. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think it was when God saw in that 20 years, we hear very little of 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, we hear enough that could have happened in one year. I mean, we just don't hear much. Uh, that's what God means. If I was, if I were growing up, say I'm Theodore's size, and I'm beginning to realize that I have strength nobody else has, okay, that'd be hard to handle, would it not? I mean, I see young men who think they have strength that nobody else has. They really, I mean, they're really, you know, pretty average, and it, they still have a hard time handling it. Uh, a young man who, who thinks he's really good looking has a very hard time dealing with that as he grows up unless he, unless he realizes how futile those things are and seeks the Lord. But anybody who puffs him up or adds to it or, or if he gets too much praise, it can totally ruin a young lady or a young man. Uh, and understand the challenge. Until you have been David on the throne or Solomon on the throne or Samson growing up, until you have been in these men's shoes, be careful passing judgment. You've never dealt with what they dealt with. And make sure you're doing real good on what you're dealing with. Amen? Amen. So that's where we, we learn to keep in our place and, and pay attention and not pass judgment. What, what has God put on your plate And asked you to do. And how well are you 
since you're on, Samson's done. You're on stage now. You know, he's talking about the fact that the Lord had planned out Samson's life and didn't ask Samson if that was okay. Every little Levite boy was raised knowing that he was going to serve in the temple. Nobody asked him. Every son of Aaron was going to be a priest. Okay? There were many times a daughter was given in marriage to someone and the, the parents arranged it. We live in a society where we think that we have a right to do everything. In fact, our society is so cuckoo that they think that they have a right to decide what gender they are. Um, but in reality, God didn't set the world up that way. And Jesus, why was Jesus a carpenter? His father was a carpenter. It was right for him to learn that and be a carpenter. Okay? When Jesus came into the world, God mapped his life out for him and said, this is the, this is the way walk ye in it. And he did. And yet we think we've got all, all these decisions are our own, right? No. Any thought before we go to prayer? Thank you, Brother Philip. Those were a lot of good points made there. I think even if we try to be honest with ourselves, you can get a pretty good idea of what it'd be like to have our story in the scriptures, and um, that should humble us. Right. We can read these fellas' story, and we can say, well, I wouldn't have done that. Well, then don't. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what you're supposed to read it for. Yeah. Well, the thing is, uh, most temptations have a, have a setting have a preparation right. period. And when we just read the account, we don't read all the preparation that took place to prepare the person to fall in that situation. And so we're totally lost as to why that would be such a big deal, perhaps. I mean, depending on what it was, unless you've experienced similar. Um, but then in our own life, can we, can we perceive the things, the real issues with us, how, how uh, Maybe there, there's been a stage set for something, and there's been a lot of building and pushing in this direction for a long time. And so if, if you were to fall in that area, other people would be looking at us like, what? Why did he fall for that? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, it's because of all the groundwork that took place, and he just finally got to the point where he just felt like he couldn't take it anymore, and he broke. And if, if, I was, if, if I'm standing back watching Jesse's mistake, it's easy for me to see you shouldn't have done that. Yeah. But then when you were watching my mistake, like, you say, why'd you do that for? Yeah. So what we need to do is say, oh, Lord, help me with my path. You know, I've got all these people in the scripture that I can see their mistakes. I shouldn't make any of those, right? Since I'm now so smart. Yeah, let's pray.